think it is. I've had at least four already. Two microphones going. Yeah, I see my other mic. Okay, thanks. That should be better. All right. All right. So, where we are, we're we're going to enter Persian territory today, but the what we've done so far is really just done fermions. The fermions we have these two two invariances. So we had one invariance, which was x goes to x prime, which is x plus some c. So these can all be indices put on here. But that's a local invariance. And in this case, just psi prime of x prime is psi of x. So psi is a scalar under this guy. And for this one, we just needed the, Vier, the tetrad, the Vierbein, Ta mu goes to T prime A mu D X prime nu D X mu uh, T A mu. Okay, so all, all we have to do is just shift the Vierbein. If we, however, there's this second invariance where we take take psi goes to psi prime, which is some s of x psi, where that s is equal to e to the i omega mu nu sigma mu nu. So that's a function of x, and there's a half there. Okay, and in this case, what we needed is we need both the tetrad and a uh, covariant derivative. So we have d mu is the d mu plus a mu. A mu was a a B mu uh, S A B over two and S S was sigma A B with a again a half. So I've got all my halves right, I'm just doing that from okay. And this was an invariance if if A went to a prime, which is S A plus, so a gauge transformation, S minus one D mu, mu S, S minus one. So this guy just behaved like a gauge transformation. At the same time, we actually have to transform the index on the um, tetrad also. Okay, let me write it down and upper. That way it actually is, is lambda a b. Um, T b mu. Okay, so that the both the Lorentz index on the tetrad transforms and then the, the gauge fields. So let me just summarize this. The overall the Lagrangian is psi bar I gamma A T A mu D mu plus A mu. A mu is above there. Psi. And then T has its double transformation property. T prime mu A is dx prime mu, dx nu, T. And then there's a, let's see, both transformations, lambda A B, T nu B. 
Okay, so it has a double transformation. And actually, A actually has a double transformation also, A prime. You have to transform the mu index is dx um, nu x prime mu s k plus s d s s minus ones where they belong, minus ones, mu's where they belong. And actually this is new. Okay, so you've got the double invariances and but you've got local symmetries in both cases. Okay. So our goal is to take this now and make it look like general relativity. The the first thing we do is just like when we did general relativity, we get a field strength for a commutator. So we're going to now have R mu nu A B, which is our curvature. Okay, so again, as we, we've got E mu plus A mu and A mu is one half S A B, A B mu. And we want to take, let's imagine we take the commutator um, D mu with D nu. Now, knowing what the commutator is going to work out to be, we're going to call this one half S A B R A B E nu. So there's our equivalent of our field strength tensor. And let's just start taking the derivatives. Um, okay, the the first piece. The derivative acting on the A pieces starts off this way. Anyhow, so it's one half S A B. I get D mu A B nu minus D nu A B nu. So those are the derivatives acting on the A. And then there's A commutators. And Let me just write out what the A commutator is. I've got one, one fourth from the two one halves than the SAB commutators. And I gave you those commutators last time. So let's just, this is the Lorentz group. So A to B, C, S, A, D, minus A to B, D, S, a C minus A to A C S B D plus A to A D S. I need a B C there. And then I have A A B A C D. Okay. So that's that follows from the Lorentz algebra. Okay, now these the groups are in groups of two. The first one I'm just going to keep basically unchanged. So S A D up to a relabeling is has the same form as that. And the first and the last group together, the second and the third group together. So let's just write this as the first term, the top line. Plus there's a one half. I have S A D. What do I do? A A B mu A. Now B and C have become the same, so C D mu. Okay. And the second one. 
um, I'll do it's minus S A C. Now B and D are the same. So it's A A let's see, sorry. B A C B. That B should be downstairs. You and me. Okay. In good shape. Um, the orderings here are a little out of order, so let's see. I missed this one. That should be a B. B's in, with B and C were the same, so B and C. So the first two here, the the second and the, the last is there. But I, as I get to get rid of this guy, I'm going to do two permutations. I have to invert the B and the C on that, that piece right there that I'm circulating. And then I'm going to also change the sign on SAD. Okay. So if I come back down here, I write the first term. I get, it's all right, I'll relabel it. It's one half S A B. I relabeled A A D A D B. So the internal ones are contracted. I've got mu and nu. And the next piece ends up just being anti symmetric in mu and nu. So A D A D B nu mu. Okay. And you can sort of guess that just because the, the starting point is anti-symmetric in mu and nu, so this guy better be something that's anti-symmetric in mu and nu. Okay, so this gives me my curvature R A B mu nu D mu A A B mu minus D nu A B plus A A D A D B mu nu minus the reverse. Okay, so we've we've entered this world where objects are looking familiar except now that they've got two types of indices, so we're a little bit of um, dis, disjoint because of having two types of indices instead of one. But otherwise, it looks, it looks sort of like the usual curvature if I had replaced A by the connection. And it sort of looks like a gauge theory, it looks more like a gauge theory where this is should be a field strength tensor and the gauge field has two indices instead of one. So big deal. So it sort of looks in a world halfway between the two. Okay. And it's a lot of the fun comes from connecting these up. So let's actually first, the first thing I wanted to do before too much else is I want to connect the spin connection and the usual connection, the affine connection. A, A, B, mu, so one space time index. Yeah, yeah. Lorenz, yeah, it's you, yeah, the I think the the point that it. I, I, well, 
So I want to do it with by covariant derivatives. I also wanted to, f you're forced into this construction by doing fermions. Whereas if you're just trying, if you're just playing around with indices, um, you can build up this construction without having fermions, but you're not forced into it. And so the question is what's more primary? Um, the argument the, on a particle physics side is that the fermions are primary. So the, the spin connection, the A is more primary than the gamma. Gamma is a derived quantity and in fact doesn't have all the properties that, that a relativist would assume. Okay, so it's sort of a, what comes first? <laughs> But I, you can't, 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 if, if you're going to construct fermions, unless you know the answer, you can't guess the form of the fermion Lagrangian without, without going through the spin connection. Okay. So what I'm, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try to connect the two of these. Um, but we'll see actually that, that, that leads us to consider a generalization of what we used to do. Okay. All right, so my, my goal in this is actually first just, just to derive that a covariant derivative um, d alpha on t a mu is zero, okay? This is the equivalent of um, the covariant derivative on g mu nu equals zero. So that's the metricity condition that we have a metric. So first do that. So the, the, the general, when you have a, a derivative um, okay. you have to watch me here because my notes have a different notation than what I'm writing. So if I change, I'm changing notation as I'm writing. So Let's let's try to be as close as I can. I'm going to do d mu t a alpha. So I've actually reversed the indices there. It's going to be the usual derivative a. Actually, let's make that new. That makes it better. <laughs> to see. Usual derivative, and then the, one contracts. The A index with the, the spin connection, so A, B, U, T, B, nu. So that's the spin connection is the connection for the Lorentz-like indices. And the space-time indices are contracted with gamma. Alpha. Okay, so that's that's the general definition for indices, Lorentz indices, and space-time indices. Then what? Pardon me. Get more. Yes, yeah, so you get more. You repeat same. the process. It's a it's the same rules of the game as we did before, except that you've got two types of indices. Though the the ones are use the spin connection, the other ones use the or the Lorentz connection is actually maybe an even better name. But you you didn't even know need to go through spin to define it. But we did, okay. So now we want to do d alpha g mu nu equals zero, which is d alpha um t a mu t b nu eta alpha beta. No, a b, a b, sorry. There, those are definitely Lorentz like indices. A b. Okay, so there's two terms here. There's, um, there's, um, there's, uh, let's make it t. A mu d alpha t b nu plus the other one. And then 
we should investigate also the a mu b nu d alpha eta a b. Now, you would normally say that zero. It's not quite as obvious with these spin connections. But in fact, the anti-symmetry of the spin connections forces that also to be zero. So actually, let me just drop that. Okay. I actually, there's a two lines of algebra to, to, to show it, but this equals zero because a a b equals a b a with the minus minus sign. Okay, so you just yeah, that's what it is. Okay, so this then is the is the derivation that implies that um, d alpha t a mu equals zero, which is what, what I wanted to get. So the logic is, is simple. It's just basically the usual metricity condition is, is this condition on the connections. But this then lets us solve for for the spin connection in terms of the usual connection and derivatives of the metric of the Vierbein or the tetrad. So I'm going to set this equal to zero over here, over there. And then I can, depending which one you want to consider as primary, we then have the solutions that A, A, I'm copying it, mu is T A nu, the derivative of T nu B plus T A nu gamma nu rho mu T rho B. Okay, so basically to get this one, I just multiply by the right factor of the tetrad to get rid of this guy. I then get tetrad derivative tetrad plus gamma, with two tetrads. And this the indices, space-time indices work out right there. This guy's got two Lorentz indices, so A and B, A and B, and all the others are Lorentz ones. Or if I go the other way, so if I take A as primary, then I get gamma mu nu lambda is so T lambda A G mu T A nu plus T lambda A a, A, B, U, T, B, nu. Okay, so for this one, I just multiply it by a different T because I want to get rid of that one. So I multiply by the inverse of that one. And I get gamma in terms of derivatives of tetrad plus A's. Okay. So now, that's fine. We, we now know the relation between the two. Well, so, so this, this, is a, this is a deep question. So the question was, what do I mean by primary? Okay. Um, so these two fields are, are related to each other. And so there's a renaming going on. Um, if you started off with this this gauge theory construction using fermions, A feels like the gauge field of, of that construction. And so then you, you would say that, that A is the primary thing. A, A is the thing we start with, and gamma is what we end up with. Okay. If you were 
just trying to match fermions onto usual general relativity, you might have said, well, I'm going to take the, the, the affine connection of general relativity, use this relation, there's my A. Okay. Okay. Exactly. But, but logic, if you think of the logic, you know, the logic of both of these, at least the field theory way of doing the logic is, was that we're constructing a gauge invariant Lagrangian, so we need gauge covariant derivatives. Um, if starting with the fermions, A would really be primary, would be the, the basic field there that you'd have to do. And ga this gamma would then work for all the other fields too. So you'd get covariant derivatives of both types by using this definition. Okay. Yeah, we haven't we haven't gotten there yet. The, I, 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 I'll, I'll be saying that in a minute. So let's let's. I'm going to say one of two things. Uh, I assume you get an identity. Yeah, it's it's a, it's an identity. It's, they both follow. They both follow from this and the fact that t's are inverses of each other. Okay. So, but there actually is a difference here that we've uh, we've gotten uh, uh, out of this is that, especially in the second way, it's there's no symmetry obvious for for gamma lambda mu nu. Okay, whereas before in in, in the mu nu indices, okay? Before I had chosen, I had chosen gamma, the anti-symmetric piece of this, equals zero by, by choice. Now there's, there seems to be no reason for that choice, okay? And this is, this is the fact that leads, leads us into torsion. Distortion is going to be the anti symmetric piece. Here. Okay. All right. So I'm almost ready to go there, uh, but I first have to do what Bossom was urging me to do, which is to, to talk about variation. So here's I'd like to do this equivalence. Okay. We've obtained by different methods here. Previously, we obtained the action. We wrote it as the square root of um, g, so d, d4x, square root of minus g, uh, minus 2 over kappa squared times the curvature. And we wrote the curvature as a function of the connection, which we wrote as a function of g. Okay. At this stage, we're going to write this as the d4x. Well, square root of minus g is is t. This anyway, the g is t squared, so you just we just give it the simple t, um, and then we'll form a connection. A uh, scalar which is T A mu T nu B R mu nu A B. And R itself is a function of A. So in the pure gravity sector, we can do the various of the following things. We can, we can either, we can, um, we can solve A is some A of 
the derivatives of t. Okay, we can put in, we, we could up here write this in terms of derivatives of t. There's derivatives of t you can put there. Um, you can plug in and vary with respect, respect to t. A. Okay. This would be called the second order formulation. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. T is second order. Because it's a second order equation in terms of T. The other thing we could do is we could treat T, T and A as independent. You vary with respect to A, you gives you A as a of t, t. And then you vary second variation T gives you the Einstein equations. Okay, there, for pure gravity, these are the same. So this is the first order. Palatini. Palatini formalism. And we did this this Palatini formalism before for R of G. You could do it, you can actually do both of these first order or second order if this is all you've got. Okay. Um, the there's one slight difference. Okay, so let's just I'm not going to do the whole thing. Let's not do the whole thing. Let's just do part of it. The, the last variation in both cases okay. um, you take delta S delta T turns into so it's A no, it's mu A. Okay. So you've got you've got in the equations with one Lorentz index and one space-time index, so it's R A mu minus T A mu R equals zero. That's that's the last variation that you get out of either of these steps. Okay, and for pure gravity, you just construct this, turn this into the usual equation by doing T. Um, T B nu A to A B times this formula R A mu minus T A mu R. And you get the usual R mu nu minus G mu nu R or zero. Okay. And this this works. So there's there's pure gravity. I've just basically done it. Um, the if you do this with scalar matter for scalars or yeah, also for fermions, F mu nu, F nu, you get the the same right hand side as usual. So you get T mu nu. Then you get the symmetric T mu nu, basically because these equations were symmetric. Um, however, it's, it's actually not true in um, if you have a drag field. And you can sort of see this already.
Remember the, the Dirac field starts off as um, sidebar gamma mu, gamma, sorry, gamma A P A mu T mu plus dot dot dot. And so then if you do the variation of the Lagrangian with respect to T mu A, you get on the Dirac side um, some sidebar pi gamma A D mu psi. Okay, then there's some variations from delta A pieces. When you convert this into a space time, you get psi bar pi gamma nu d mu psi plus delta A pieces. Okay, but the point is that this is not automatically symmetric. Okay, so your equations now is r mu nu, r mu nu minus g mu nu r. This is not automatically symmetric either. Now g mu nu is, but r mu nu doesn't have to be. So suddenly, one of the new changes again is that R doesn't have to be immediately symmetric. Um, and again, the lack of symmetry of R's is an indication of torsion if it's present. Okay. Um, I realize I skipped over one equation I wanted to give you, so I got a nice big blank space here. So let me just write it down here, which is I didn't give you R mu nu beta alpha. So boom, 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 three indices up there. That's the, the Riemann curvature is the connect between the two here is T alpha A T C beta Eta, no, let's see, um, B, C, R, mu, nu, A, B. So in the conventions that I hope I'm using, that's actually where you put the indices is not completely trivial, but, but the, there's one of the T's that carries an upper index to give you the reminder curvature. And hopefully this, the contraction of this with the right indices that I did back at the start gives you the curvature of the curvature I gave you. Hopefully I got that right. So, so, so if you, in, unless you impose that the, the affine connection is is symmetric in the lower two indices. R doesn't turn out to be automatically symmetric. No, it doesn't have to be symmetric. It's not symmetric. It's because it's a variation of a non-symmetric quantity. Here. The and you put all those terms in there. The 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 delta A terms will end up giving you something that's symmetric only if you then go along and you plug in delta A in terms of delta gamma and delta gamma in terms of g mu nu, where, where it's symmetric. So, so you're imposing the symmetry by choosing gamma mu nu to be symmetric. Okay. Um, yeah, 
if gamma if gamma was the usual gamma, then it would be symmetric. But it, that's right. There's there's these other delta a pieces here that can also be anti-symmetric or non-symmetric and cancel out. And that's presumably I haven't actually worked it out, but presumably it's what happens if you choose gamma to be the old Christoffel symbol uniquely. But the point of the the exercise here is there's nothing in in the system that at this stage tells us that we are going to use ga gamma is that particular form. Okay, no, nothing in what we've done has has forced that upon us yet. Okay, metricity doesn't force it upon us. Okay, that's the transition then to torsion. Okay, so let's. Go back. I'm going to do torsion first, sort of the usual space time way that people do it, and then come back and do it in terms of the spin connection. Okay, ready? Torsion. So when we started, we we started by taking, wanting covariant derivatives and we, we wrote this as d mu v lambda plus gamma lambda mu nu of v nu, okay? So that was our starting point. And we wanted this to be such that if V, the vector transformed like a, a vector would, so V lambda goes to some lambda, lambda sigma is the function of X, A sigma, so there's a vector transformation property. We wanted d mu v lambda to go to lambda mu nu lambda lambda sigma d nu a sigma. So these are all functions of x. So that was our requirement. And we found that the following worked. That gamma lambda mu nu, which is this Christoffel symbol, didn't use that notation much, but there's the Christoffel symbol. If this worked, I take one half g lambda sigma d mu g nu sigma plus d nu g um, mu sigma minus d sigma g mu nu. That that led to this same transformation property. Okay, and but there's an ambiguity and now let's, let me put it down the line. Okay, um, let's imagine if we take any true tensor Okay, so a true tensor, uh, I'm going to have three indices on it, C lambda mu nu, transforms to lambda sigma lambda mu. Sorry, this is, that's a lambda, not an A. That's a lambda, not an A. There's another lambda there, mu alpha, mu beta, C sigma. Um, alpha beta. Okay, so in other words, you, 
you just transform with these three guys already. Then then gamma lambda mu nu being this one we have above, the Christoffel symbol mu nu plus C lambda mu nu also works. Okay, works means that that d times vector is lambda lambda dv, which is the condition that I had above. Okay, this guy right there. Okay, because this guy transforms correctly, it added is just an additive term. And so what we in fact showed, well, or at least argued that this piece, the Christoffel symbol is, is unique if two conditions are satisfied. One is D lambda g mu nu equals zero. So this is the metricity, a metric theory. And two is, was the condition was that g lambda mu nu is symmetric. Okay, so symmetry. But at this stage, staring at this, we'd say, who ordered that? Because it's not coming from fermions, it doesn't look like it's an obvious feature. Um, and so torsion is then just defined as the anti-symmetric piece. T lambda mu nu is gamma lambda mu nu minus gamma lambda mu nu. So it's, that's the conventional definition of torsion. Okay, so it's consistent with the met metricity condition. And so in fact, here's here's an exercise. Let's just, I'll, I'll give you the answer without doing it. But if you do the following, you take D alpha G mu nu. And you just write this out as you know, D alpha G mu nu minus gamma alpha mu lambda G lambda nu minus the other term gamma. There's another G term. Okay, so one portion of the exercise could be just to set that equal to zero, but for the purpose of this exercise, let's let's imagine we just have something that's not zero. So n mu nu alpha. So this would be non-metricity. Okay, then you repeat this with d mu g. Uh, nu alpha equals blah, 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 d nu g alpha mu equals blah, blah, blah. Okay, just take the three different combinations. At this stage, it's just algebra games. And then you would find the following. You find gamma. I've got mu nu, I've got rho as my index here, so let's just keep it. Okay. It's mu nu rho if I've chosen things symmetric. There's two other pieces that can happen here. Let's call them k mu nu rho plus 
w mu mu rho. The k comes from the anti-symmetric pieces. Um, k um, mu nu rho is one half the torsion t mu nu rho minus t mu f. Rho nu minus T nu rho mu. I've got my notation right. Okay, so it's just it's basically this torsion which was defined by the, as the anti-symmetric parse up there in various combinations, and I've. I, the indices are raised. This guy, this index should sit off to the side here in this notation. It sits, sits on to, off to the right side. And um, W is the non-metricity. Rho sitting there is one half eta mu n mu nu rho, the non-metricity pieces. And um, Mu rho mu minus n rho mu. So this is some non metricity, which we will set equal to zero here. But if you, if you want to be general there, this guy, the torsion piece, is actually has this funny name the contortion tensor. Ordered yourself to do it, I don't know. But that's that's what it's called. All right. Um good. now let me make my first complaint about about torsion, the standard treatment, which I have to admit having taken this opportunity to survey what's being done. Uh, it makes me think that there's a lot more stuff to be done or understood uh, that most of the people I think do it wrong by my standards, of course. Um, let's just do a simple thing. Let's look at normalization. Okay, how do you normally normalize a field? Okay, what's what's the normalization that you choose? Um, so torsion is some tensor field. It's just it's as you can see up here. It's just some I've added something to the uh, connection that transforms like a usual tensor. So it's just a tensor field, plain old tensor field. And what's the what's the right normalization of a particular field. So it's a tensor field. And normally what you would do to normalize, you would choose d mu t squared with one half in front of it minus m squared over two t squared. So forgetting all the indices you would you would normalize it. And in fact you normalize it for, to get the right kinetic energy. Okay, but we don't, we're, you will see that we don't have the kinetic energy piece obvious from the Lagrangian that we, we're gonna end up with. When you start doing the phenomenology, the normalization is not obvious. So I could just as well do the following. Let me leave the normalization floating at the moment. I'm going to write it as gamma lambda mu nu minus gamma 
lambda nu mu. And let me call this kappa squared m squared over two tau lambda nu nu. So instead of making it um, a what factor of one there, I'm gonna let the normalization float and we'll look for m Now, one of the things that you'll see is that the torsion looks comes out looking first like a mass term. If I choose the conventional normalization, it looks like it has the Planck mass. If I choose this normalization, it looks like it has the mass M. There's no way that we can dif differentiate between those two at this stage. I will have other complaints as we go. All right. Let me do something a little bit boring, but I just, that's worth seeing it. Um, the, again, let's look at the properties. Of, of A and the torsion. Okay, um, damn, this is a little boring. Let me quickly just state the result. Um, we previously had this formula d mu t a nu minus plus a a mu b t b nu minus equals gamma mu nu alpha t alpha a. Okay, that was the condition that was like matricity. Um, if I take the anti-symmetric pieces of this, if I take then um, d mu t nu a minus d nu t a mu plus a b nu minus a a b nu t b mu. This is then this torsion tensor t um, mu nu alpha t a alpha. So here's the torsion. So what we did before we, we solved for A in terms of derivatives of the connection and I mean of the tetrad and the connection, but now I've got, I'm gonna eliminate that and in favor of the torsion. Okay, so this guy now is, is my definition of A in terms of derivatives and the torsion. Okay. Here you play algebra games and I, I won't do that on for you. Um, but A A B mu is going to be written as gamma A B mu plus K A B mu, where now the gamma piece here is what it would be if torsion is zero and the K piece is the torsion piece. So previously we, we didn't have a good separation, we just, so here, here's, here's the breakdown. Gamma A B mu is so B T C mu 
And then there's a bunch of coefficients here. Let, let me write it out and say what they are. C, A, B, C minus C, A, B, C. Um, plus C, B, C, A, where C, A, B, C is torsion, uh, tetrad, tetrad, derivative, tetrad, and labels go mu nu up there, a, B downstairs, C up there, and then mu, new anti-symmetrized there. Okay, names. This is the Levi Sabita ten, um, tensor. It's the spin connection without torsion. These are called Ricci rotation. I don't know why. But they're just derivatives of the, the metric, basically. So if you want to write out the coupling in terms of this with no torsion, this is what you use. And K actually is this contortion tensor, but just with K mu A B is this contortion. is minus V C mu T C A B minus T A B C plus T B C A where T has got T a, B, C is gotten from gamma mu nu alpha with T's here. All right. All right. I don't know. That's boring. So let me tell you something that's not boring. Let's see if I can squeeze this in. This is actually a good thing to do here. Um, we had two invariances. There's, I, for one of them, I found a field strike tensor. So there's two gauge invariances. There's a field strength tensor associated with one of them, which is TA, R, A, B, mu, nu. There's a field strength tensor for the other one also. So field strength for the translation invariance. So there's a second field strength tensor, which is interesting. Um, so let's let's define D um, A as a as a covariant derivative, um, and I'm going to take D A prime psi prime is um, d a psi. So the d a is going to be, in this case, is just this t a mu d mu. That's what we had before. But on a vector field, it would actually be different. Um, if we take some vector field v, A equals T, T mu A, A mu. 
then then there would be a a different a different definition then for derivatives on a vector field. D A V B would be um, this T A mu D mu B B, but then there'd be a connection piece also A. Um, a C B B C. Okay, this A is just gotten from the A mu. So A A B C is T T mu A A mu B C. All right. All right, so I, I've got these derivatives, and now I'm, I have to commute them really quickly. Let me just tell you what it, what it is. Let's. Um, so if I do d a d b on side. Okay. Um, I don't have enough time to do it. But basically, I use these two definitions here. The first one, the first derivative, it just acts like a regular derivative with a T on it. The second one has a connection there. Okay. This gives me, so after, after a bunch of work, A, B, C, D, C on psi. So this is that derivative that I gave you above, TAB. And if I solve for TAB, C is minus TATB mu nu, D mu TC nu minus D mu TC nu plus these A's. A B C minus A B A C. Okay, a bunch of algebra there. Sorry. This then, if I go back to some space-time indices, T C mu nu is d mu t c mu minus d mu t little t c mu plus a c d mu t I'm going to have to repeat this next time d mu minus a c d mu t Okay. The the point of this is if I convert this one more time, t t rho mu nu by doing t rho mu t uh, t rho c c c Okay, you look at that and you go back up here and you see my connection between uh, way up here. Um, gamma is T derivatives of T and A. I come down here. Uh, torsion is the anti-symmetric part of gamma. Torsion is the anti-symmetric piece. I come down here. And the I get an anti-symmetric combination of derivatives of T's and A's that the field strength tensor for this other transformation here is the torsion. Okay. 
So that's if that's the prettiest way to construct torsion is actually all as the field strength of a of the second gauge transformation. Okay, so I'll come back and I'll summarize that, and then we'll do some brief phenomenology, probably half the class is worth, and then maybe move into anomalies. Okay, good. All right, thank you.